while our actors are finding their place in the audience, I'd like to invite our panelists to come up and take their place at the table. And while our panelists are coming up, I just want to mention a couple quick things. This is obviously not where the play Ajax ends. Um, it is Tecmessa's last line in the play, which I was thinking about tonight for the first time. Um, and something kind of remarkable happens. Um, scholars have had a problem with this play. They actually call it a problem play. So that when they can't deal with the play and they don't know what to do with it, they call it a problem play. Um, those in the military that we perform for have had no problem understanding this play. And the second half of the play, which is so problematic, which involves leaving Ajax's body on stage for the second half of the play. And then people descending upon it with his now sort of powerless wife, Tecmessa, not able to sort of intercede or even have a voice for the second half of the play while they determine what is to be done. First, uh, Ajax's brother arrives milliseconds too late. You've heard him calling out for him the whole time. And he beats himself up in front of his fellow soldiers. And he says, where can I show my face among what men when I was not where you needed me, when you needed me the most? And a lot of military audiences have said that sounds like survivor's guilt to them on the part of a brother. But maybe that doesn't carry the full weight of what a brother would feel if he lost his brother this way. Um, and uh, then fast forward to the end of the play, Agamemnon, the general the, who's in charge, he arrives uh, after some sparring between um, Ajax's half-brother and, uh, and, and Agamemnon's brother. And he says of Ajax's body, which again has been on stage the whole time, uh, leave that man's body to rot above the earth. He shall receive no honor in his death. He shall be fed to the dogs. And in the final seconds of the play, Odysseus, the very man who, who uh, won the armor of Achilles with his rhetoric and his wit, but sort of set this chain reaction off at the same time. He comes back and he defends Ajax's body to the general, and he says of him, um, I'm moved by admiration for his greatness rather than hatred for his smallness. Many of our friends become our enemies. I don't see friends and enemies as mutually exclusive. And he tries to convince the general with rhetoric argument to allow Ajax to be buried, but the general's not interested in his arguments. And, uh, but he walks away. And that allows a funeral to take place, a funeral procession that doesn't in, by any means honor or, or carry the weight of all of Ajax's accomplishments and courage and valor, but at least acknowledges his humanity, acknowledges his family. And it's with this final procession that the play ends, and I sort of wanted to resolve it to bring you all the way through to the end so you can see that 2,500 years later, we're still struggling civilian, military, American, English. We're going over to Scotland next week and then on to Amsterdam to do theater of war in Dutch. Um, you know, what the, what's left at the end of this play, how do, we, how do we honor the accomplishments of great men and women like Ajax who sacrificed so much and their families sacrificed so much uh, for something bigger than themselves without honoring um, violence, without honoring destruction, without honoring what happened at the end of Ajax's life. Um, how do we balance those needs? How do we, as communities, help people to heal? Um, those are questions that are left in the wake of the play. We're gonna return to those questions in a few seconds. Before we do, I'm gonna turn things over to my panel. What I forgot to mention is whoever's making the best eye contact gets to go first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm gonna let our panelists introduce themselves <laughs> so you can hear who they are as it pertains to what they have to say and then um, launch directly from that into your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Tammy Morgan. I'm a military spouse. My husband will be celebrating 27 years of active duty this May. Um, we've been married for 22, so it's been um, an interesting ride. I've got two boys. I'm here as a member of Blue Star Families, which is an organization that bridges the gap between military families and the community at large. Oh, you can go. I'm sorry. You can go directly into your comments. Into my comments. Um. um okay. I. Thank you. Um, it was moving. I, I think what I noticed the most in the two scenes, and it's very interesting as a military spouse, is how many, um, how vocal Tech Mesa was. Um, you often don't find that with military spouses. Um, it's a big joke in most of the services that military, that military did not issue families with the active duty member. So a lot of times we, um, we joke and we often say we're the silent or maybe not the not so silent service. And it was interesting to see what an active role that she had in the two scenes. Terrific, thank you so much. Sir. 
Uh, my name is Joe Hunt. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I'm currently the director of the Veterans Mental Health Coalition. I'm not a clinician. Uh, so I'm involved a lot with uh, not providing direct services to uh, veterans or their families, but training those people who do. Uh, the majority of the coalition are civilian providers who have who are non-mental health providers. So this whole uh, performance is, um, I think, very difficult, at, at least by my lights, a very difficult thing for the civilian population to appreciate. One thing that struck me in the play, I think, was, if I heard it correctly, was that the veteran suffering is better off in Hades, mm -hmm. and that hurt yeah, uh, of all the places for someone suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was the thing that struck, with, struck me the most. And I think the overlooked, uh, what we've come to over, well, I, including myself, uh, when I got out of the military, I didn't realize the impact I had on others around me. Uh, I drank a lot when I got out. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that I'm involved with the coalition for the past few years, I realize how impacted families, mm -hmm. spouses, caregivers, and everyone associated uh, with the veteran uh, cares. So, the, so Ajax is... Uh, mental state is uh, uh, inflicts twice the pain. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Ma'am. Um, I'm Holly Dando. I'm a social worker and I'm a clinician for the Headstrong Project. I work with veterans and I also run a, a support group for their spouses. So what you said resonated with me because one of the first lines that um, Tech Muscle spoke was, how can I speak something that must, should never be spoken? And I, I know that my spouses struggle tremendously with simultaneously witnessing what their spouses have been through, almost experiencing it, but then not being able to talk about it because of the uh, weight of the secrecy. And trauma is always about secrets. So that was what struck me. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. My name is Kim Burdett. Um, I'm with an organization called TAPS, and we care for the families of the military fallen, and specifically, I work with our suicide loss survivors. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of what um, Tech Mesa shared before and after Ajax's death is exactly what we hear from our families. I mean, it's just spot on in her confusion before mm -hmm. um, and her sort of primal panic in, mm -hmm. I know him, I know what is going on. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I sense that in his voice this is going someplace that is not good. Mm -hmm. um, and after he died, um, I'm also a suicide loss survivor myself. My brother was a Marine veteran and died by suicide. The sound that she made, that guttural, I mean, is I, 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 the first person I called after my brother's death, a good friend, said I had nightmares of mm -hmm. that sound. I mean, it's, it is that much of a shock. It is that much of foreign uh, you know to be plunged into that that experience and the things that she that she spoke of is exactly what our families you know what we're hearing the confusion the how could he do this to me what's going to happen with us now um you know how, where do we go from here um the other emotions expressed of you know how, how good did i miss this how did i not see how did i all of the regret, all of the, the guilt and the conf that is just spot on with what we are seeing with our families. Um, and you know, TAPS, if we existed back then, um, would, have, would have stepped in and been able to, you know, to kind of care for all of the, the people grieving, you know, such a shock and such a, just, you know, it, it's a type of loss that has so much, um, it's, there's just so many layers of confusion around it. Um, you know, what type of funeral do we have now? Is this an honorable death? Um, what you know? What? Uh, how do I speak of this? How do I tell children? How do I tell the story in my hometown? How do I? Um, you know, all of all of those questions just come crashing down on those survivors, and you could you could see that in Tech Mesa that mm -hmm. she was dealing mm -hmm. with that. Um, you actually had mentioned that you know that there is this an honor. You know, how do we honor this? Um, you know, the best way that we've 
figured out at TAPS is to honor the life and to honor, you know, the, the service. Um, you know, it takes literally the heart of a warrior to serve our country. <laughs> and to honor that, you know, the, those who make that choice. People die. They're not defined by how they die. So, so much of it resonated. I, did, I couldn't pick one line. Gosh. So, <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. I am Scott Krawczyk. I'm a 30-year veteran of the Army, um, and I've transitioned into academia. I'm now a dean at LIU Brooklyn. I was at West Point uh, for a total of 13 years. Uh, my deployments do not include the most recent to Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, I went to Panama and then shortly after to the first Gulf War and was there for the um, better part of a year. And then I was with the Ranger Regiment and um, experienced colleagues being killed in Somalia, you remember, in 1993. So what I've just personally seen is, you know, um, the grieving. I've seen spouses and I've seen something that struck me here for the, for the first time uh, was the mention of mother. Um, I, had, I hadn't even picked up on that. I'd seen this once before. But it struck me because, I mean, we're talking about the families, at, you know, the, the, the entire family unit that's affected. And I found it striking that Ajax thinks about his mother wailing in, in such a powerful way that seemed almost like it was echoed by Tecmessa in a sense, that we get that wailing through Tecmessa or something. But I've, I've, you know, been to these uh, memorial ceremonies and burials and hugged, you know, the mothers of uh, soldiers I worked with, and it's a powerful thing. Um, and I will just share this, that, you know, a ceremony that I put together at West Point, I invited a, a mother uh, and a, a spouse. Um, and there was an interesting uh, dynamic, and the spouse wrote me a lovely letter later. I can't remember the details of it, but I remember her feeling that there was a kind of out of respect for the mother. They hadn't been married that long. Uh, this was a young man I taught uh, at West Point who was killed shortly after he graduated. Um, she felt almost like the, that the mother deserved to be there in some way that she somehow didn't. And I found that you know, just so illuminating about the family dynamics and responses of the spouses. Thank you so much. I'd love to thank all five of our panelists with a big round of applause for getting us started. It's no small thing, especially at a radio station, to come down and, and make such personal connections in front of an audience and to take the time to, to, to be present in that way. And I just want to thank you for your courage and your candor. You have five live mics, which is more than we have out here. So I hope you'll jump back into the conversation whenever you feel so moved. Thank you to the actors. And, and the actors. Yeah, We're well, delighted that they're, you. yeah. Um, um, and as I mentioned before, I'm going to turn my back to you, but not out of disrespect. Um, please jump back in and think of this as a 360 degree conversation now. I also wanted to mention one other partner that I was derelict in not mentioning um, for a very f uh, sort of funny reason. So uh, one of our um, strongest partners under the residency right now is the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence. We have a number of people here from that office who are our partners on a series of projects on domestic violence that we're doing throughout the city uh, with a streetcar named Desire and a few other plays. And I mention that because, uh, the reason I forgot them is because, uh, and we've, we've, they're gonna have their resources out in the lobby alongside the Department of Veterans Services, it, is that we discovered along the way that all 22 of our projects are domestic violence projects. Yeah. That domestic violence and the, the, the experience of intimate partner violence mm -hmm. actually maps onto all of our projects yeah. in a way that not all the projects map onto each other. And I just, so, so the reason that I forgot them is because they're ever present and I'm just really glad that our partners from OCDV are here as well tonight. Um, so now turning out um, to the audience, um, uh, I just wanted to um, throw out the question that we've asked uh, hundreds of audiences all over the country and the world, but just with a little more context, which is simply, we don't think that there were any women in the audience. I mean, there might have been a few. And the actors would have been men. So Tecmessa would have been played by a man. So I wanted to give, put that context in place to say, what, is, what do you think this guy Sophocles was doing when he brought together 17,000 citizen soldiers in the center of Athens during a century that saw nearly 80 years of war and staged this story for them? Um, what was he trying to say? What was his objective? What was he trying to accomplish? Now, ma and no matter what audience we're in, whether we're in a 
giant field house or a basketball court or a bookstore or a lovely radio station, there's always one extremely kind person. <laughs> Usually the most attractive person in the room. <laughs> often the most intelligent, <laughs> who puts us all out of the long and awkward misery of an interminable silence. So I'll wait until that incredibly kind, intelligent, wonderful attract. I knew it was you all along, man. I didn't want to know. I lost what your question was, but, but, <laughs> but the question that I really have, and I mean absolutely no dis disrespect with this question, but I'm wondering if people can speak to how does all this go to let's stop doing this? Mm -hmm. I don't mean all the, the help and services. I mean, why do we keep going to war and why do some boys feel like really proud to do it and, and all that? Sure, I'll, I'll take that back. And, and that, that could be answered by someone on the panel, although we don't in our form put panelists on the spot. Um, <laughs> Or maybe someone from the audience would like to jump in, but I'll just reframe the question just briefly, which is to say, um, you know, uh, I asked the question, what was Sophocles trying to do when he staged this for his community? And I hear in your, your question, is this a condemnation of war? Is this, is something happening in this highly democratized nationalistic place and moment and if it is, if Sophocles, then you know this larger question: um, How do we ensure that people don't suffer in the ways that Ajax did and his family did? If if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, jump in, yeah, please. I was thinking when uh, it was becoming inevitable that he was going to kill himself. I was thinking he didn't get that armor. That armor was really, really important as a as a totem of meaning. What does this all meant? I've been doing this for years. I've been taking risks. I've been the bravest. I've been sacrificing myself. I've got to, this has got to mean something to me. And when he didn't get that armor, the only thing he could do with that rage was to kill himself. That, that was what, that was his response to the lack of meaning. That was all I could take. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. I've never heard that answer before. Yeah. And I like that from a clinical spec perspective yeah. as well, yeah. that, um, it's not the losing his friends. It's not the nine years of nonstop battle. It's not uh, the any one of those many stressors that it's it's, it's the ultimate stop, stop. loss of sense of meaning yes. that causes the thing to railroad out of control. Exactly. Which was tied with his identity. And his right, identity. Exactly. That's why you go to war, right. I think. Yeah. It's an age old question, though. And I mean, you think about the sorry, but poem Wilford Owen, a Del Canticorum mm -hmm. Est, which talks about the old lie, right? Let's not tell the young people the old lie that it's sweet and fitting to die in battle for your country because we don't want this sort of perpetuation of this myth. It's just one of those things that perpetuates itself in some ways, partly and excusably in the terms of patriotic response to you know some crisis. And, and we have to acknowledge that we're lucky to have that as, as a, a nation. But at the same time, I'll say this, uh, the old lie, this was written around, this was he, Wilfred Owen's World War I vet. They weren't talking about these problems openly. The only way you could perpetuate the myth was because you hid these problems. Mm -hmm. And we are doing something, I think, that's remarkable 10 years in this particular setting, but elsewhere that's exploring and being far more, you know, sort of brutally honest with ourselves about what this really means. And I think when we hear about, you know, sons of, of uh, veterans and so forth, I think there's a lot more, at least for me, uh, there's a lot more circumspection when it comes to thinking about, you know, where I hope my son, you know, ends up in the future. I have to, you know, I want to be very open-minded and see everything, right? Thank you so much. Were, were you going to speak as well? I didn't, I didn't want to cut you off. No, okay. I have a non-clinical. Yeah, please. Yeah, and then we'll go back to the audience. Yeah, please, sir. Uh, it, it struck me that his, his actions and in seeing what he'd wrought was in such conflict with his vision of himself mm -hmm. as a warrior Absolutely. that he saw no other way yes. uh, out. Mm -hmm. And it was that that took him not, uh, it was, uh, he, he had no other way to go. Yeah, no. Softly does something really remarkable. He, he takes us inside, not just the mind, but inside the thought process, the ideation of a person who feels very logically, if you mm -hmm. follow it, that there's no other way. 
um, to end this pain, to, 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 to deal with this lack of meaning or this, this void that I now feel. And I, and I would just say, I relate to Joe's earlier comment about behavior that is sort of acting out or self-destructive. It is some manifestation, in a, in a way, of that, that response to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just leave it at that, but it, you know, there are sort of, there's a spectrum. Uh, and Ajax took an extreme sort of step, but you, you know and we've seen other means of sort of self-destructing uh, through behaviors and, and acting out that are unhealthy. I know we have a hand out here, and we're going to keep riffing. Yeah, please. Yes, sir. Oh, um, Came right to you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't really have a question. It's just an observation that the very first question, so I'm going from one, one end to the other. The very first question, and then your comment, uh, at this end, um, seemed to me to be, s made me think, Sophocles himself, I mean, you guys were saying what you said, you asked your question, as you've reframed it so nicely, uh, Sophocles himself is, not to use the word problem play, but he's problematizing, yeah. mm. that, that new way that people say things, he's, he's making <laughs> war a problem. Mm. Or he, I, I got the impression that he's asking these same questions mm -hmm. yeah. in his play. Mm -hmm. And I think I felt it most when um, in this brilliant staging of Ajax going crazy, mm -hmm. suddenly he said, wait a minute, he's not going crazy. He's totally lucid. He knows exactly what he's got to do. That's what you all were saying. Mm -hmm. He's got to go do what he's got to do. He's not going crazy, but then he's going crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Don't do it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm talking about the very last moments, yeah. you know, not about the cows. I mean, yeah. then he's crazy. When he does what Athena makes him do, he's got divine madness. We know the director, director tells us he's crazy. But at the end, when he kills himself, I think it's, you know, it, is, it, is he crazy or not? Yeah. And that's, is war, what is war one thing or not? And to ask, to make it a problem is mm -hmm. what makes this so yeah. provocative. Yeah, I'm ever gonna come right to you, but right over here, there's a, there's a hand right in front, and then we'll come back, and we'll come up here. And we'll go well, just to return to your original question. Thank you. But oh, everyone has been touching upon it. <laughs> yes, but I they have. It. <laughs> but you have to look, too, at Sophocles' other work, yeah. like Antigone sure. and Oedipus. Yeah. And you understand that his struggle was to answer that question. Yes. Yeah. Is it right yeah. or is it wrong? Yeah. Was Antigone yeah. incorrect for burying her brother? Yeah. Because that's what she felt. Yeah. And she died for that. Yeah. Was she crazy? Yeah. No. Yeah. Right? And, and we have a project called Antigone and yeah. Ferguson, which is our police community <laughs> relations project. And we're going to do a run in Harlem next fall, September through October. And I hope you all will come to see that there. We do a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So Sophocles, absolutely. Sophocles presents, um, in some ways, questions that can't easily be resolved. And characters who all believe they're right and someone is going to die. And that's what makes them tragic. And, and we learn, the characters learn milliseconds too late how they could have potentially stopped it. And a lot of our audiences, as we've been touring Theater of War, but other plays by Sophocles, relate to that most. Um, the, the questions left in the wake of any kind of death um, that have already been raised. Um, I, I, don't, I think we're, we're going to come up to Edward, and I'll come back. Oh, I promised him up here, and we'll come back to him. I think Sophocles also wanted those 17,000 soldiers in his audience to know you're going to be widow makers, orphan makers, mm -hmm. slave makers. Mm -hmm. Your family may be uh, affected that way. Mm -hmm. Your mother may lose her child and certainly the enemies. And I think that he wanted them to know this is war. Thank you so much, and thank you for returning us to the theme of the night, which I appreciate as well. Thinking about this, this audience of mostly men watching a play in which Sophocles gives a female character who's a minor si significance in any Greek mythology as many lines as Ajax. Mm -hmm and puts her center stage and has her saying those lines that we heard tonight in order to confront them with the reality of what this means um, for their families. 
Sir, you've been waiting for a long time. I know there's a hand up here, and I'll come right to you. Hi, how you doing? Hey, how are you? Uh, first of all, I think I, I, I would personally like to congratulate or thank uh, all the actors and the actresses for uh, their performance. That was stellar. That was like, uh, that really was. <laughs> and, and, and truthfully, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not big into theater traditionally, but uh, you guys could have been reading Cat in the Hat, and I would have been all in. You know what I mean? You had my ears. We'll try that next time. Yeah, right? <laughs> but the intensity behind uh, which all the actors and the actresses did, Peter's voice was like phenomenal. Like I want him to record that, and like I want to hear that voice like permanently. You, you know? can, uh, it's live stream, and you can watch it 365 there we go. There we more go. days, more year this year. But, but I think to, to answer the first question, um, <laughs> certainly as a disabled veteran, I can answer the question to the first lady who spoke of. Uh, I don't know about going to war, but I know for me, like let's just be bluntly honest and uh, be transparent. Like some of us didn't have a lot of options. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was a uh, foul ball in 1990, and I wasn't doing a lot, you know what I mean? And it was going to be the military, literally, and I had that option uh, bestowed upon me by a kind judge. You know, you two nitwits need to find something to do and pick a branch. And they still did that back then. You know, I mean, and I also like to think for me personally, I have a son, I have two daughters. Um, serving a higher purpose, and, and that's, that's unique in this day and age, isn't it? And especially in America. You know what I mean? This self-absorbed technology and self-absorbed people that we are, including myself, you know what I mean? That sometimes it's just, it's not about my meanness. It's about doing something for a higher cause, whatever that is. And it could be getting a paycheck because your parents have been poor for generations. Mm -hmm. It could be a thousand things. But make no mistake, there's no one who puts on a uniform who's not a warrior at heart. There's no one, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I think it was just a fantastic uh, mm -hmm. portrayal. You know what I mean? Linguistically, and you know, the words and the way that they described, and, and certainly how they described for myself, I have it PTSD. You know what I mean? What Peter was telling him, I'm, I'm, that's all I'm looking. I'm going, this guy needs, like, I got to bring him to the VA with me or something. You know what I mean? He was <laughs> raging, right? But is that not? I mean, and that's, uh, is that not pride, some perhaps clinical evidence, uh, too, that with PTSD even in these days? So I'd like to thank the uh, actors and, and, and everyone for uh, putting this on tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can thank I you. jump in? Yeah, please jump in. Yeah, yeah. Is your right? Actually, yeah. I wanted to touch on that, um, and what, and I'm sure you see it quite a bit. It's it's that honor to devotion and duty, and, and the willingness to serve, but willingness to serve at such a level, and as you saw in this play, that you're putting that honor and willingness to serve above your family. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that I, in, it's hard for me as a military spouse to reconcile because I know my husband loves us deeply. Mm. Um, but that's something, and I'm sure you hear all the time, um, that's that little bit of frustration. I'm very proud of what he does, mm -hmm. and there's a part of me that understands that, and there's that other part that has a hard time reconciling that, because you know at the end, his armor meant so much yes. that he put that yeah. over, his, over his wife, who was begging, begging him. literally yeah. begging, yes. and um, that wasn't lost on me. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've never heard it said that way and so clearly, and I really appreciate you bringing that into the room, especially tonight. I feel like one of the core themes of the play that's, uh, in fact, all the plays we do, but this one in particular, is betrayal. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I thought about it from Ajax's perspective a lot, you know, because we've done it from that perspective a lot, you know, mm -hmm. you know, putting him in the center of the reading. And, um, you know, he feels betrayed, and that betrayal, that injury that comes from the betrayal, that psychological or moral injury that comes from having the, his north and south totally upended mm -hmm. by this act of giving the armor to someone else, sets off a chain reaction of betrayals. Oh, but, yeah. but what I hadn't really thought of in the way you articulated so beautifully is how military families, not in the heat of battle, not, but just by the very proposition the day -to -day. of a relationship mm -hmm. with someone who ultimately has already signed up to have allegiance to something. To something, mm -hmm. to something bigger. And you even yeah. see it as she's not only begging for her life, she does, she puts her son out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that was, after that, that's, you don't have another yeah. card to play mm -hmm. yeah. on top of that. And it, he was still firm in his resolve yeah. of what he wanted to do yeah. and what he felt he needed to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's but, a bit, yeah. But he, yeah. I'm sorry. No, oh, you have the it's mic. It's a lot. Sorry. <laughs> Somehow the mic slipped into someone's hand. No, go ahead. <laughs> My question is about what does it mean that I believe he killed himself because of the shame of killing the animals? I mean, I realize it's chain reaction, but in the end, even he says that it's the embarrassment, mm -hmm. the, the shame. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about that. About his 
see a hand over here? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say that I've been thinking a lot about shame as I was watching this, and I think that's one of the reasons that Sophocles presented this to 17,000 yeah. citizens. Um, when my father was in the military, but I can just think about all those soldiers and how they've been taught to behave and how they've been taught to comport themselves in a strict and very prescribed way. I don't think they had an opportunity to talk about their feelings, to think about their feelings, and one of the, for me, one of the most profound feelings in this play is, <coughs> is shame, is Sophocles' shame. I don't think it has to do with the animals explicitly. I think it has to do with the sense of being betrayed and his loss and his humiliation by the generals and just the kind of downward spiral of mm -hmm. losing all of that. I just wonder, you know, in that time, as, as maybe today too, uh, warriors and others just don't have an opportunity to talk about feelings or even know that that powerful feeling can unravel a life. So. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe's going to grab the mic. I know someone up here, but I'm just going to double team right here. Yeah. So a <clears throat> couple things. So, so I'm a 20-year combat infantryman. Now I kind of work as a clinical psychologist at the VA in uh, Columbia. Um, and so when I come to these, it's, it, it's deep, it's impactful, um, and it helps my brothers and sisters kind of share in our burden. But I think the main reason that Sophocles wrote it in to address your question, obviously, I mean, honestly, I, I haven't been able to think about anything since I heard your question, because it kind of touched me deeply. Um, like, why do we do war? And, and I almost, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it makes it sound like that it's the soldier's fault. Um, this isn't the soldier's fault, and, and this message isn't for the veterans in the room. This is for the non-veterans who have never served, who can't touch the shame, who can't touch the betrayal. Because um, when we come here, it's just like when we hear Ajax and Tecmeso and my wife, it's like, we, we got it, we know it. This is just reminds us, and it takes us back. And the message is for you, um, the, the citizens who, who send us forth. So Jack Jacobs, a Medal of Honor recipient from Vietnam, he said, uh, if not me, then who? That's why we go. If I don't go, then who's going to go? If my sons and my brothers and sisters don't go. So this isn't the message about our pain and our impact. This is about you and what's your responsibility. And I appreciate you coming here tonight. And I appreciate Brian creating this forum. So what do you do in your daily life? Because this, this is our reality. You don't have to live our reality. How do you help? How do you impact? Thank you. Joe, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. Is that, um, there's someone with a mic, and I know you've been waiting for a long time, and I, I apologize. And then somewhere, so I'm going to shift to a second question, and you can just ignore the question and keep going, but I want to move us into another, into another uh, topic. And it's just okay, like, well, I'm going to ignore the yeah. mic. Uh, ignore the question, yeah. anyway. Um, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and um, uh, we started an organization called We Belong Network, Vets for Vets. And the reason why is because uh, the high rate of suicide of, of veterans um, who come home, and the reason why this, we have this is because they operate on such a high level when they're in a war theater. And then they come home, and then this is where the, the killing of the chickens and the animals come in, because you can no longer uh, act out um, your, your, your feelings and, and your anxieties that you, that you have or that you perceived to have even, all right? So these veterans come home into society now and don't know how to readjust. Mm -hmm. So we're caught out there. So that's PTSD that he had. So he didn't know how to, he didn't know how to act. He didn't know how to mm -hmm. um, develop it. He didn't know what to do with himself. Mm -hmm. So he decided, I'm gonna end it all. Mm -hmm. And most veterans that come home think of that. Some act on it. Some don't, and those that don't, we move on to do other things greater, some, some not so great. 
then we go into other things like addictions and, uh, and other outlets. There are a multitude of outlets that veterans choose to go that, that, that makes society part of the problem because we don't know how to adjust after be re-entering into society. And I, I, thank you so much. I would just add, because I, Joe, I think, really um, brilliantly said in another one of our convenings uh, that he felt, and I don't want to speak for you, but that civilians also don't know how to adjust to veterans. Mm -hmm. right. And we should, we need to, you know, think about the equation in, in more than one way. And we, civilians, I say, you know, and that's part of the reason we're doing this exercise. You've had your hand up. After your, if your comment, I'm going to shift to my second question because we want to get at least two more questions in. I just wanted to make a quick comment regarding Tess Messer's role and um, what Sophocles was, well, what my impression of yeah. what Sophocles was trying to say um, during that time, and that's the importance of the woman in this whole scenario. Um, Ajax speaks of his mother and is um, concerned about his wife and, and what she would be experiencing. And so I just think that um, being a woman in society and sometimes being that second and third class citizen in a lot of different scenarios, I think that what he was really trying to show is the woman in the center of so many arenas and really what her experience is and her experience of being that caretaker and that caregiver. Um, even, you know, the, the scene where he is going through his, um, his mind um, 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 confusion. Um, so how that relates to how a spouse takes care of her veteran, her, her spouse, and deals with that issue too. So it just speaks really highly of um, the importance of women in society, the place and the role of women in society, and how many multi-layers of um, uh, responsibilities that go um, unnoticed and unidentified. Um, um, sometimes it's not even given a name, but it's expected. So I just really see the role of the woman being like so important in the center and her having such uh, a wonderful um, expressive voice. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, I really appreciate that. And it's kind of amazing that a play that was performed in a time about a woman who wouldn't have even been considered necessarily even human by the Greeks right. because of their xenophobia. Mm -hmm. Everyone who wasn't Greek was barbaros, bar mm -hmm. barbarian mm -hmm. uh, from their perspective. Um, in a time in which women had no rights, still within the context of this theater of all men, of all male actors with a male playwright, still to this day bringing forth that silent role and giving it voice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's really amazing. And her lines have authority about him. Mm -hmm. I know him. This yeah. is, you need to listen to me mm -hmm. because this mm -hmm. is not his normal behavior. Yeah. This is not. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, I mean, it's even more powerful that he gave her such a loud, not even just a voice, but such a loud voice Come about in. the warrior. Mm -hmm. And, and when she comes out of those gates, um, out of the tent, she's saying things to the men, and they're saying, that's a sane man's voice. Right. He's fine. Open right. the door. Maybe he'll right. snap out of it with shame, they say. Mm -hmm. Let's shame him. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, and she's saying, I know that tone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I had a comment about the shame, too, because I think you see that in Ajax. He acknowledges that, or he, you can see that he, he knows this behavior is not really him. He's So he's shameful of it. You can kind of see him yeah. kind of in the waves of it, and he knows that this this is not me, but I don't I don't, I don't see any other alternative. But isn't that part of the logic as mm -hmm. well, that yeah. when a person feels that he, he or she cannot control the pain they're inflicting on others, mm -hmm. that it's not, it's not simply about them? I mean, right. we, we've changed, and even in the last 20, 10 years, our understanding of suicide within the military, but also in the civilian world, mm -hmm. it's no longer thought of. Someone raised, this has seemed very lucid, um, as necessarily a result of a mental health disorder. You know, in the, it, you know it, it, it's, uh, it's seen in a different way. Um, it's certainly not seen as a moral failing anymore in the way that it was for, for millennia up until this moment. If you so. believe you are the problem, then mm -hmm. you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to remove the weakest mm -hmm. link. Mm -hmm. So it's remarkable that he brings us that close inside. Um, and not only that, but he stages the death. And in the Greek world, um, violence was not 
enacted on stage. So it was not a small thing to have the actor do it, mm -hmm. rather than having Messenger come on and tell us that it happened. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna shift gears to my second question. They're all the same question at the end of the day, um, but I wanna just um, go <laughs> deeper on Tech Mesa just for one second, because we came here, we called it the Tech Mesa project, so we might as well. Um, so uh, in the play, Tech Mesa has this incredible set of lines I wanted to ask you about. She says, um, she's trying to convince the men to stay and to help her, and she says, um, Tell me, given the choice, which would you prefer, happiness while your friends are in pain or to share in their suffering? And the men say, twice the pain is twice as worse. And she says, well, then we'll get sick while he recovers. And, they, and she says, I don't, they say, I don't understand the logic of your words to her. And she mm -hmm. says, okay, in his madness, he took pleasure in the evil that possessed him, all the while afflicting those of us nearby. But now that the fever has broken, all of his pleasure has turned to pain, and yet we are still afflicted, mm -hmm. just as before. Twice the pain is twice the sorrow. So here's this spouse talking about all this pain the men are going to experience if they go inside the tent, but she's talking about pain. What is this spouse saying? What does she mean when she says twice the pain is twice the sorrow? Why does Sophocles have her say that? And you can always, you know, just say the thing you were going to say before. But yeah. <laughs> well, as a spouse, yeah. everything about Tecmessa and something that somebody needs to understand, everything about the role of the spouse is we're silent, but we're silent because we've given up ourselves, complete Absolutely. selves, whether it's career choices, whether it's uh, the military decided today you're moving to Guam and you have to pack up everything and go. Everything is ev forever tentative. Your children have to pick up. They have to move. And in this identity, you become the soldier himself. You are the carcass of this man, and you just move and flow. It's ebb and flow with him. It, it, and then somewhere when he retires, you form this own identity, or so you hope that you're gonna get an identity because you've given up 22 years or 26 years, and now you get to be Venia, but you've never been. Mm -hmm. So she is him throughout this whole process. Mm -hmm. For every crime he's committed at theater, she's a part of it because he brings it home, he lives it in the house, he writes it in the letters, and she has to stand there. So who better than to know? I, I say like, a woman knows her child before before he even comes out, but we know our husbands just as well because we hear his moans mm -hmm. when nobody else hears it. Yeah. We we know what he sounds like when he tosses and he turns and he's had a really bad night. And we have to be there whether we want to or not. We have to be there. And so you know, there's this uh, there's this thing that I was thinking about when you hear people tell you all the time they thank the soldier for his service. Well, now every once in a while you get someone who says, well, thank you for your service too. Well, we've been servicing just as long. Mm. And the same thing that brought you so much valor, then however, the parallel is so funny, the one thing that brought you so much valor brought you so much shame, but yet we carry it too. So um, I think what she's really saying mm. is for everything that you do, you sow it down the line. The mm. lineage falls. Like the Bible says, it goes so many different generations. It, your pain is my pain. It travels. I didn't put on a uniform, but I still fixed it for you every day. And I still fold that flag when your day is gone. And whether you decide to live and come back and live this resilient life when you decide you want to take off a uniform, I walk with you. Or if you decide to take your life, I still have to tell everybody how wonderful your life was or find the best way to make your life carry on because you made a sacrifice, but I sacrificed too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I've heard many people stand up and say, I am Ajax. And I've heard many people stand up and say, I'm Tech Mesa. Mm -hmm. I've never heard someone say, Ajax, Tech Mesa is Ajax. Basically mm -hmm. the same. She is. She's, she's like his twin. She's yeah. his mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a huge insight, um, the way that you've put it, framed it tonight. And I really appreciate it. Also, I was listening to you thinking about how we've learned an, uh, so much in the last even 25 years about epigenetics, that, you know, how trauma can affect the, our mm -hmm. genes in a single lifetime. Mm -hmm. And thinking about, well, what does twice the pain mean? Well, twice the pain is this, the cur you were talking about a curse among long down generation. How does it get sewn mm -hmm. into the DNA? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it can happen in our life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it happens to everyone who's in the, in the collateral zone mm -hmm. around it. Sick, demented life we've created this my, my husband now is a recruiter and I tell him all the time tell the young men what they're really giving up don't tell them about you get to see the world 
No, tell them about the real estate. Tell, okay. tell, tell their the wives players. to call me. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> tell them that when Sam calls, you go. Right. They, right. They, don't, they don't care that your son's birthday is tomorrow. Mm. They don't care about that. Tell them that when you marry me, you marry this. You marry mm. this flag. Tell them what you really signed up for, that you may not come home. Mm. And does he do that? He does, and if he doesn't, he can't come home. It's not all. It's not all. Thank you for your service. When Taps plays at night at my base, every night we stand and we get quiet because it's a reverence. Even our children. It's a reverence. Our children stop playing on the playground. They don't understand about the death, but they know that Daddy stops. And they know that in the middle of the beer, you sit it down or you pour it out. But you know what it means. It's, a, it's, some, it's something about it. It's in your gut, and you don't even understand it. But it's a reverence to all the things that we all give up. It's not just about the man in the uniform. I have a uniform, too. It just looks better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know there's a hand over here. I just want to say, to synthesize two things, that, or th this other thread that we've been talking about, about the cost of war, um, and this recruitment thing. It's amazing that you brought into the room uh, while si also like taking twice the pain to another whole other level in your interpretation. Um, you know, I think um, uh, we were doing a performance recently for the Joint Chiefs. So we had the, the, the four highest ranking, or we had the highest ranking generals in the world and then all, all of the combatant commanders that could make it that night, so 24 star generals in the room. And, and they were wiping away tears, and they were with their spouses, and the second person to speak was the commandant of the Marine Corps, and, and he answered the question, what was Sophocles doing, and he said, this was training. And I wish every Marine, he said, could have this training before they go to war. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a condemnation of war, or it's a democratic articulation of the cost of war, mm -hmm or it's just the morally right way to prepare people for the complexity of war, it's something that we're not doing in our society right now. Um, and so I love the idea that a recruiter could be the front lines of, of telling people the truth well, about pulling back the curtain here yeah, and yeah. letting them actually see what the day-to-day -day is. Absolutely, your hand was up, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. oh there was a mic right there, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I've got so many different <laughs> train or whatever threads going mm. through my head that I don't really know which one to say first. But it, as far as um, that pain duplicating yeah. or yeah. quadruplicating, yeah. Um, besides generationally, I'm also thinking of it, you know, like when somebody dies, it's like throwing a rock in the water and watching the ripples. Mm -hmm. And how many people that they affect who then affect who then affect in the here and now, not just not talking in the future. Um, so there's that. There's also, you know, the pain of bringing it back to suicide, the pain of those, you know, the person who committed suicide is gone. They're out of their pain, well, depending on what you believe. But those who are left are the ones who <coughs> are, you know, it, depending on who they are, and they're holding on to it. And it's affecting them forever. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that point. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention was, um, when you talked about why he gave um, Tecmessa such an important yeah. role at that time, I think it's <laughs> partly that even though she maybe is him and she's inside, she's also outside. And she's kind of the only person he could put there who is like outside of those rules, both mm. as a woman and as a foreigner. foreigner. She's not a warrior. Mm. So those rules that they all live by, you know, it's like when you, when you see things as an outsider that mm. people who are in it mm don't see. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, that was one idea. I really like that. I really like that thought. You know, I, I, that's one of the thoughts I hang on to as we perform in so many places where we're the outsiders and we come in and we ask the questions in a way that can't be asked by the community for itself, but we ask them not, you know, expecting necessarily that we have the right questions, but, but that we can ask questions that other people can't. And that Tech Mesa offers a, a uh, perspective that the warrior can't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Tecmessa as all those multiple identities that she is, the other, a woman, a spouse, a battle bride, uh, in a war zone. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, S sir, yeah. Um, clearly, um, some of the themes that are front and center today have been front and center for a long time. And I'm, 
really interested in the, the Commandant of the Marine Corps talking about this is training. Um, what can the panel speak to any preparation that people get for this kind of experience that seems so vibrant and so meaningful um, as part of military life? So, so can someone speak? Yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, about. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. You mean in preparing someone to go to war, or? Yeah. It, well, uh, for, it, it, for the experience of the, the of this strong emotion. The moral complexity, if moral I understand. Complexity. Yeah, are, have we have we evolved in our understanding of how to train people for the moral complexity mm -hmm. of um, combat or mm -hmm. life and death situations? Mm -hmm. Is is this? I mean, I would just I'm just going a little further. Mm -hmm. You know, is this cohort of veterans who've come back and our and fam military families who are openly talking about mental health, changing our culture, and and has it had an effect on military training or how what's happening at the highest mm -hmm. level? Well, I, I would say colonel, that, right? you know, I mean, there, <laughs> there certainly is um, training or education in some of the moral decision making uh, that involves um, rule, uh, rules of engagement and, and um, you know, the complexity of, of um, deadly weapons on a battlefield and, and second order effects and all of that. Um, I don't, we have conversations, uh, and I actually defer to my colleague over here maybe about more recent mm -hmm. ways of training soldiers and talking about this, but I, what I can tell you from my experience is that one of the things that I think almost, um, you know, unspoken in a sense was a training to sublimate so that you didn't think about, so that you could focus on the mission yeah. and, and, and block things out, and frankly, I mean, I will speak as someone who's spent a long time doing this. I'm extremely good at compartmentalization, and I don't know that that's a good thing, mm -hmm. but I'm very good at it. I learned how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I, that, was the, that was my training and my experience, and I think this new generation has encountered a different way, perhaps, and I'd, I'd love to hear a commentary on that, maybe. I think we have one here. Was that going to be to that? No. Um, <laughs> it's along those lines. Okay, great. The, 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 uh, parallel <coughs> communicating universe is fine. Well, I just want to say that um, as an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran myself, um, I appreciate all of this discussion about um, war and its effects on the, on the psyche of soldiers who fight it. Um, but it strikes me that this play is not necessarily a story about um, war. Um, it's set in wartime. Um, uh, but, but like Mario Puzo, the author once said, uh, the godfather is not a story about the mafia, it's a story about a family whose business happens to be organized crime. Mm -hmm. I think that it's fitting that Sophocles uh, set all of his plays in wartime because, well, his world was war. Um, but to me, this story is mostly about suicide. Um, and I think that what Ajax experiences um, is the effects on him and, and the reasons that he killed himself were not necessarily related to his wartime service, as far as I can tell, at least from this play. Um, I think that uh, the humiliation he suffered, uh, the shame, the loss of his friend, these are not soldiers' issues. They're not Marines' issues. They're human issues. Um, and I mean, suicide is a big problem in the military. It's a big problem in the veteran community. Um, but it's not a military problem, and it's not a veteran problem, it's a human problem. Um, and I think that um, that's often overlooked, and it's ignored by society at our peril. Um, so I, I think that, you know, all of us can learn a lot from this play just about what it means to be human and, and, and to realize that, uh, there are, that suicide is an issue that um, is complicated and multifaceted and often uh, 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 deals with a range of issues, a confluence of um, problems and events that all come together into a perfect storm, um, as we've learned. And um, it's just worth remembering that. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Joe, do you want to jump on this? You don't have to. I never call on people, so I don't. So I have a very complicated answer to do we do training like this, and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to say that we got our start, and there's a hand right here, we got our start as a company because the Department of Defense contracted us to go and do hundreds and hundreds of these performances. They weren't thought of as things we were doing right before people deployed. They were often when people returned. And that's why I was so struck by the Commandant's comment 
was, he said before, um, you know, what would it mean, regardless of whether where our political positions, what would it mean when we train young people to go to combat to, to address the moral complexity of what they're gonna do? You know, certainly it's not adaptive in war to be crying um, or to be overwhelmed with emotion. Uh, I don't think anyone would take that clarity of mind away from people who are, who are, who are fighting. But it seems Sophocles was saying there has to be a time when it's permissive to scream like Tecmessa was, when it's okay to cry in front of your friends, when it's okay to acknowledge that this, there's a toxicity and a pollution that comes with any life and death experience or experience of human suffering that we can't just compartmentalize. Yeah. Whether you're a doctor, you work in a prison, you're an EMT, these are all audiences we also perform for. Um, someone, you have the mic, sir, and then after you, we'll go right behind you. Um, I want to address the uh, comments about the uh, Commandant Marine Corps saying yeah. that this is training. Um, I got out in 2013. By the time I got out, I had two DUIs and I had been uh, demoted. Um, if you go back to 2003, that's when I joined the Marine Corps. Eight months later, boot camp, um, MCT, uh, my specialty school, um, and then I was in Camp Pendleton in February. Um, I spent, at the end of my first week at Camp Pendleton, uh, I was loaned out myself and like five other Marines that had just arrived to a u another unit and had been thrown out that we were gonna go to the desert. And somebody said 29 Palms, and anybody that knows about the Marine Corps, 29 Palms is like one of the worst places to go, and I'm like, damn it. But whatever, you know, at least we're gonna go do training, because I, I hear it's good training. At the end of that week, it's like, no, you're going to Iraq. So I spent two weeks in Camp Pendleton. At the end of my second week, uh, I was in Kuwait. Um, there was a checklist before you deploy, right? But that's all it really was, from what I remember. You know, gear, uh, medical. Anybody that's been in the, in, in the military knows what it is. Um, as far as getting prepared mentally, um, I don't really remember much. Uh, boot camp, they create that, you know, try to create that fog of war. Um, try to get you to do things on reflex, on, on you know, just command and, re and response. Fast forward three years later, I've completed my fourth tour. And I'm not, I'm, I was a non-infantry, but by then, in this time, it was a year after Iraq had been invaded, and so now you saw the buildup in Iraq. And what I remember most is the change in ROEs, um, the change in technology, the upgrade in technology, and a little bit more as to like our mental health, but really, we just went to the medical officer. Yeah, I'm good, because nobody's gonna Nobody's gonna, you know, come come forward with that. I didn't. Mm. 2007, I get my first UI, and it gets kind of thrown under the rug. Because three months later, I have to deploy. Mm. I don't have time to be going to 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 Sacco, to to the wizard. You know, Sorry, that's, that's just to clarify. The wizard is the name for a psychiatrist. Or psychiatrist. Yeah, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. I think it's awesome. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's you know, no, nobody's gonna do that. Um, and so when I did go to, to, to the substance abuse counselor, I lied my ass off about mm -hmm. my drinking. And, and even then I didn't realize that I, I was doing this. You know, I was deploying, I was coming home and I was living it up, because that's what we did, you know. Um, and then fast forward again to like, what was it, September 2011. It was my last deployment. This was my seventh deployment within nine years. And by then I was infantry, because I, I decided to go, I was like, if I, if I already deployed four times, I might as well go infantry. But again, what I remember mostly is the change in ROEs every deployment, and then also the change in technology, um, which was great. Um, my first incident in an IED was in 2004. I was completely exposed, so was the whole back of the vehicle. Fast forward to January of 2012, and the, compl the vehicle is completely arm up armored, but it's still the same, as far as I'm concerned, it was still, it was like I was back in 2004, being blown up, completely exposed. 
Like that's what it took me back to. And you come back, and now I have my second UI. But all 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 along, I'm trying to like tell them I'm supposed to go see I'm supposed to go see the uh, the the TBI clinic. And they're like, oh, they're gonna come, they're gonna come. They, they came three months later. This was like a week after my DUI. Some of the things that I did see was the change in um, as soon as I got as soon as I I got into the second explosion in 2012, I was immediately evacuated. As far as I was concerned, I was fine. I mean, I couldn't sleep that night, but as far as I was concerned, I was fine because that was my reaction to just keep going. But there was a change in how they, they kept us out of theater for about a week, which is, up until that point, I, I, I started remembering the first time in 2004, and I was just like, this the explosion happened, and it's like, five minutes later, you recollect, and Corman's like, hey, how you doing, you good, okay? That's what it was, and that's what it was. And that's what sometimes is, it has changed and it has improved. Mm -hmm. And you do, they do these cognitive tests before you deploy. Mm -hmm. And then I had to take them again when I got blown up in 2012 and I failed them completely. But to me it was just like, you know, when I got my second DUI, I ended up in rehab. And then I realized, okay, something's wrong. And then that's when I kind of started seeing more of a shedding light on the stigma of, mm -hmm. you know, that thing. Mm -hmm. And every chance that I got to speak to now my junior Marines was like, if you're not sleeping, you need to say something. Mm -hmm. If you're drinking every night, you need to say something. You know, if you're having nightmares, you need to say something because you hear it every day that it's okay and that's what we do. We go to sleep drunk. We wake up drunk. We don't sleep because whatever, but it's not. We normalize it within the community. Mm. And we keep it to ourselves. Mm. Has there been changes? Yes. Mm. I, I, I deployed seven times over nine years. ROEs and technology improved. Mm -hmm. Definitely saved a lot more lives. As far as the stigma of addressing mm -hmm. the issues, slowly but surely, but not enough. Mm. Mm. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for everything you shared. I really appreciate it. And for taking on so many threads and synthesizing them and, sh and showing us what it is like to be, you know, what, what this answer to this question of what it, how were people prepared and what does a Marine really experience? Mm. Um, I also feel like the, the um, it's because of the courage of young this younger generation of veterans, I think, I mean, of course, the Vietnam generation paved the way for this, but this, this younger generation, the millennial generation, who are willing to come out and talk as you have today and, and help educate and, and enlighten and engage people who couldn't possibly have understood those experiences or even have contemplated them until you said that, that we're actually gonna see the change that is, is slowly but surely taking place and maybe not as you know, in, in the ways that we know it needs to, but I really appreciate you sharing everything you did. Ma'am, do you have the microphone yet? Oh, it somehow slipped away, Sorry. but it's, I have to come to you first because you were, you were waiting so kindly. No, it's just I th I th the points that um, were just raised by the person who was so brave to speak before me, um, I think really highlight um, the piece of the play that really spoke to me, which was the fear and the powerlessness of both um, Tech Mesa and the colleague in facing the mental um, breakdown of someone so strong. And I think it's um, out kind of outrageously risky for us to ask people who've experienced a high level of trauma to s expose how um, impacted they are, um, how impacted we are, or whoever is, um, without a really strong safety net, right? Mm -hmm. One of the key rules in the world of um, supporting educators is don't tell a teacher all the things that are going wrong in her classroom if you don't have a whole lot of solutions mm -hmm. to back her up with how she can um, get those things to be better, right? And I would think that it would be even, you know, a millionfold more true for someone experiencing that level of 
um, psychiatric, psychological, emotional difficulty to ask that person to put themselves out there and start talking about how difficult it is or how difficult it's going to be unless we have a really strong social safety net and are willing to talk about it a lot in terms of solutions, it doesn't seem remotely safe or fair. Thank you so well, much. And I had a quick comment. And, yeah. you know, not only do you have to overcome the stigma around mental health and if you're struggling, but, you know, your fear of losing your job, which is so tied into your identity, because mm -hmm. literally maybe you can't do your job on mm -hmm. antidepressants or, the, you know, mm -hmm. those things affect Declarance. your job. Mm -hmm. And your so how do you, I mean, some of their fears are absolutely real. Mm -hmm. And not only affects your job, it also affects your family because, of, because we move so often, most military spouses aren't employed. Mm -hmm. So the active duty member has to take that into concern, into consideration that that's a single, that's a one income family, mm -hmm. um, that's where the insurance comes from, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's everything, that is life yeah. Yeah. in itself. Yeah. So a lot of times they just kind of say, I'm fine, I'm fine, get me back mm -hmm. in, because they have, because, because of that, that's a huge so. fear. And that's a huge reality. Yeah, thank you so much. I really there's a hand here and there's a one over there too. Yeah, man. Um, so I wanted to speak on. I'm a um, a Navy veteran. I was a Navy corpsman, um, and also as a spouse. Um, and so one thing I really wanted to touch on is especially him saying, you know, him just saying I'm fine. Um, me working in the hospital, seeing uh, soldiers, sailors saying they're fine because they know that if they don't say they're fine, then their records get flagged. Mm -hmm. And so when it's time for promotion, mm -hmm. then they get, look, they get passed over. Mm -hmm. And it's a taboo. People want to say, oh, we want you to come in and we want you to tell us about your issues, but they look at you differently. Mm -hmm. So now you have soldiers who need to be fixed, need mental health help, and will not seek it out because they know the ram ramifications mm -hmm. if they go in. So then they have problems because now they're operating as half a soldier because they're broken. And so they go home with these issues and problems and they begin drinking and they begin domestic violence and they begin child abuse and different things like that. And um, you know, I've, I've had the, um, issues that I we live on a base and I'm the admin of the Facebook page and so I have received several um, messages from spouses stating I know there's something wrong with my husband um, where do I go how do I get help and the first place they will not go is to the commanding officer they can't do that yeah, yeah. but if you can give me now we live the VA hospital sits right in front of our base. Pretty much we can look at the VA hospital. So you would think as a veteran or active duty, you would go to the, to the VA. There's no way in the world I'm going over to the VA. Can you show me, can you give me some kind of information to somewhere else that no one knows who I am over there? And that's what I'm trying to do is trying to find other um, solutions for them that they don't feel like they're gonna be outed um, but they still can get the help because they need the help now. And so yeah. the military really, do, we, if you want to be honest, there, there's, a, there's ramifications if I come and say, yeah. I have a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you want to talk about Headstrong for a second and how yes. you all operate? Yeah, the only yeah. thing I was thinking was Headstrong yeah. is not able to serve I know, I know. active duty But even personnel. so, the, but yeah, the Headstrong, ethos of Headstrong. Sure, was, Headstrong yeah. was founded by a um, Marine who served in Afghanistan. Uh, who came home and sort of said, we got to do something about this. So it's um, cost free, very, very low paperwork. You just uh, get headstrong.org. Um, look it up on the web. A couple questions, you'll get a call back within 24 hours, intake, assignment to a therapist. We're in the New York City area, we're in many other markets. Um, where, what area are you in? Oh, well then, well then you're close. But again, but it's active duty. Yeah. Oh, right, you never know. Well. I'll give you my card, and we can, because yeah. we are in a and lot you, of other and markets. you do spouses, right? Oh, well, yeah, I run so a group for spouses. Yeah. So yeah. we've made one connection there. Uh, Flora, I know you had your hand up over there. Um. Um, a part of the, of the play that um, stood out to me was when um, 
Ajax told Tech Mesa to pretty much be, um, shut up because she didn't understand. Like, how can you speak on something that you don't know anything about? Mm. So I was thinking, what is there for the spouses? What is there for the family members? Because it's, um, and how do they deal with it? Um, I'm thinking maybe it's hard for them to speak on something that they don't know about. Maybe there's guilt there, maybe there's um, shame there because you haven't been there so you, may, you don't feel comfortable enough, I guess, mm -hmm. to speak about it. And are there, um, what are the services that are there for them? Are, is it enough services for them? And also, are the services just for the um, spouses? Are they also for the moms, the dads, the kids, the friends, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking if I have a friend that has experienced that, I would want services for myself mm -hmm. also. So are there services um, there for people like that? Thank you so much, uh, Flora. I mean, I don't know uh, if anyone wants to speak to the services. I know also we have Department of Veteran Services yeah. resources. May I? Yeah, I yeah. Just, sir, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. I'll introduce Melissa Walters. She's from DVS? And she, yes, you, yes, you two yes, should yes. talk because she can. Do you want to speak to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Department of Veteran Services, um, although we are not a direct provision, service provision agency, um, we do act as a liaison and a referral service. So, one of the things that we are currently working on is a system, right now it's called New York Serves, um, but that it is a, a portal to be able to gather as many um, veteran um, service provision agencies so that veterans and military family and caregivers have a a portal to go to to be able to access what is available in New York City. Um, in addition, we're working closely with the First Lady's Thrive Initiative to be able to increase access to care, to close the gaps in treatment, as well as to diminish the stigma surrounding um, accessing mental health services. So DVS, we have different lines of action. My action and my team here tonight is re with the core four team, and that's dealing with some of the beautiful components that Brian is involved with, the culture component, it'd be closely related to that, as well as the peer-to-peer -peer component, also holistic services, as well as the mental health and caregiver component. Um, DVS also um, addresses housing, entitlements, and education for veterans, caregivers, and their families. So, um, um, headed by Commissioner Laurie Sutton, we are definitely striving to address the issues for um, the veteran population of New York City, um, trying to make it a more military-friendly city, um, and also we're just looking to partner as much as possible to be able to increase the services and the knowledge of services, um, but mostly um, diminishing the stigma, t the stigma of surrounding care and access to care. Um, because if it's not spoken about, if it's not identified, um, there's going to be less likelihood that a veteran or even their spouse is going to reach out for services. Um, also, as it relates to um, change in, in status, in certain military status, that's another thing that we want to help to uh, negotiate certain things as far as the entitlements and to be able to give information um, as far as what, what are you eligible for. Um, also, we try our best to work with the um, homeless veteran population, and we've been um, very successful in, in, in helping that population in New York City. So again, we are around. Um, we're not, a, a, we used to be um, Mayor's Office of Veteran Affairs and recently, you know, changed our name and, and, you know, but Commissioner Sutton is really dedicated to being um, not only a voice but a, a, a major stakeholder in, in, in addressing this issue in New York City. Thank you so much for bringing that into the room and for, and if people want to stick around over cookies and hear more, there are more resources out there. Um, this larger question of, and I just want to gloss it over, of, uh, when confidentiality isn't honored by the medical professionals, the HIPAA laws that protect civilians, for instance, from having their medical information shared, mm -hmm. isn't protected in the military, when there are, in the perception of those in the military, consequences to sharing mental health information, mm -hmm. how do people who are inside the services get the, the, the services and the resources they need? We're not gonna answer that question here but I, sometimes our, um, our, our performances shine a light into a dark place and illuminate something, and you've illuminated something really important that we need to address alongside. We, we, you know, Fort Hamilton is in our city, and, and it's not simply because it's on a federal 
property not part of the, the same set of questions. Um, we're at the end of our time, and I, I only got to my second of four questions, <laughs> um, but I wanted to share with you just a couple quick things before we continue over cookies. Um, one of the most common responses I hear from spouses to the tech, the tech Mesa question is, uh, it's painful for me to see or hear what my spouse has been through. It's painful for them to say it. Twice the pain is twice the sorrow. I've heard the opposite a lot. It's painful for me not to know what my spouse or uh, husband or wife has been through. It's painful for them not to have the ability to express it. Mm -hmm. Twice the pain is twice the sorrow. Um, after an early performance of Theater of War, um, someone came up and answered the first question, and we, it's sort of a benediction at the end of every performance, not to put a bow on this, because we didn't come to finish the conversation just to start it. Um, but uh, someone took on my first question of what, is, what was Sophocles up to, and this individual said, I think Sophocles uh, might have been in the minority as a leader with regard to his, his compassion for the individual in his community, individuals in his community who were struggling with the issues he portrayed in his plays. I think Sophocles wrote the play to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Mm -hmm. mm. Talking about problematizing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that a play can do both. That we can be comforted by what brings us together across very disparate and totally radically different human experiences. Um, that we can be comforted by the fact that we can be uncomfortable together in a room listening to um, Peter Whale or, um, or Katie Howell or some of our panelists speak such truthful and um, powerful narratives and aud audience members doing the same. And we're afflicted by the reality as evidenced by the fact that we end our conversation talking about resources and what exists and what doesn't, that there's so much more work to be done to mitigate the suffering of people who could be to our left and right any day of the week on public transportation, in our places of work and of worship with the screams of Ajax and Tech Mesa and Tech Mesa tonight, because that's the focus in their heads, though we don't necessarily see or hear them. And when it comes to the spouses of military families, um, maybe we don't see the spouses, let alone hear or see the screams. So we end with that affliction with that challenge to think about how we can be galvanized to go out of this room and make those uh, individuals visible and make their needs more known and, and, and challenge um, not just the city and the state and the federal level, but on an interpersonal level, um, taking the risk of feeling helpless in the face of what they may be going through, but of asking and of getting involved. It's with that sense we leave you, but before we leave you, um, and before I thank everyone, I just want to remind all of you that you have surveys, um, if they arrived, they arrived, right? Mm -hmm. In the, um, in your uh, program, so before you eat a cookie, uh, the, the, it's not a quid pro quo, um, but if you could just fill out the survey, we'd really be grateful for your feedback. Before you do any of that, I just want to thank our panelists and our actors with one long round of applause. Thank you so much. been a wonderful audience. Thank you. I hope you'll stick around and have a cookie. It's a bird bath. Um, they're really good. And, um, and we'll stick around and talk with you as well. Thank you. <laughs>